So this afternoon, I want to talk with you about something that happened back in the 1930s called the War Books Controversy, uh, and why I think it's a really useful tool for teaching about war and um, literature for the more we to today. Uh, I teach English, so it's going to come as no surprise to you that I want to talk about literature. But the stakes of this talk and of this whole series of symposia go beyond the academic field of literary studies and beyond academia and the classroom altogether. So before I get started on the presentation proper, I wanted to take a few minutes to talk to you about this larger context. Because as you can see from my introduction and the work that I do, I'm really interested in um, exploring the significance of humanities outside the classroom, outside the formal academic setting. Uh, and I think there's a lot of um, uh, power in doing that in our classrooms um, to help bridge the gap with new students coming in. Um, so I want to kind of explore that boundary a little bit started. Uh, to give us some language, oh sorry, as I was preparing this presentation, I went back to the language describing the goal of these symposia, at least as I kind of put it in the NNO. Um, and, um, and I find this very important. Um, the, the idea is that we're going to incorporate veterans' perspectives into courses in the arts, humanities, and social sciences. I think that's a great goal. But I also see a potential problem with it. What if veterans have such a unique and incommunicable perspective that it can't be shared with civilians, let alone incorporated into the structure of a series of college courses? Now, for the record, I think these perspectives can and absolutely should be shared across what's often referred to as the civilian-military divide. Um, and in this presentation I'm about to give, I hope I'm going to use some tools for making that happen. But before I do that, I just want to take a moment to consider this idea of the incommunicability of veterans' experiences and the potential challenge it poses to the larger goal of these symposia and the project that we're all um, embarked on here. So give us some language for talking about this problem about veteran experience and how it might be relevant for us as we work to incorporate veterans' perspectives. Um, I want us all to take a moment to look at, at, at this handout that I've tried to get into most people's hands. I'm a tree killer. I, I apologize. I recycle and turn off the lights a lot before I make up for my sins. Um, so this is an op-ed that Phil Cly, uh, who is a Marine, um, very, as you have here, uh, very much um, uh, not a typical combat soldier, but a Marine, or no, typical combat Marine. Um, he wrote a short story collection called Redeployment in 2012 that won the National Book Award. Uh, sorry, I think it's 2014 he wrote it. Um, this essay, uh, this op-ed piece is part of this, um, of what our whole symposium series is about. It's also at the heart of what I want to talk with you about today, so I think it's worth us taking a few minutes to look at it. Plus, it's way better to start by talking uh, together. Okay. Once I, once the, so at least we start out a week before everybody has a post lunch now. So let's look at the piece together for a minute and see what Clyde is saying um, about veterans and their experiences. Um, as you'll see, he's very much focused on a particular problem he sees between veterans and civilians. But I think as you listen, um, you'll be able to hear some ways in which this problem might connect to and be relevant for a lot of different scholarly and classroom conversations. And I'd like us to talk about that broad relevance, um, how we might use this article in a bunch of different courses as a way of thematizing this, using this question um, about veterans' experiences um, and can we talk about them across the military system divide, how we might use this. So I'm going to read you some excerpts from the handout, and I'm going to ask you then to take a few minutes to talk to the person next to you about um, how you might use what he's talking about here in, in your teaching, and um, I've got some particular questions I'm going to ask you about, but first you can just listen. Um, I'm really curious about what you make of Clyde's argument here, and especially what he has to say about our obligation to listen and try to imagine other people's experiences. We're going to do justice to the project of this new series. We need to get clear on what the obstacles are to civilian veteran communication and start thinking about what strategies will work best for overcoming them. Okay, so here's Clyde. I'm just going to start at the beginning and then skip ahead. The piece is called After War, a Failure of Imagination. I could never imagine what you've been through, she said. As a former Marine who served in Iraq, I've heard the sentiment before. It's the civilian counterpart to the veterans you wouldn't know. You weren't there. But this time it struck an especially discordant note. 
This woman was a friend. She'd read something I'd written about the rack, about the shocked numbness I felt looking at the victims of suicide bombing, and it had resonated. As a survivor of child abuse, she knew feelings of shocked numbness far better than I did. And yet, midway through, recounting some of what happened to her as a young girl, she said it again. I'm sorry, I don't need to compare my experience to yours. I could never imagine what you've been through. It felt inappropriate to respond, sure you could. I had a mild deployment. She made me have to imagine long hours in a cheap plywood desk and a cheap plywood hut in the middle of a desert. True, there were a handful of alarming but anticlimactic mortar attacks on my forward operating base and the wounded and damaged bodies I saw at the trauma center. But that was all. Her childhood, though, was full of experiences I couldn't have handled as an adult, let alone as a child. And what was particularly bewildering was that, even as my friend was insisting that what I'd been through was beyond the limits of imagination, she never once told me, you aren't a victim of child abuse, you couldn't understand. She wanted me to understand. At the very least, she wanted me to try. I know an airman who suffered a traumatic brain injury during training just a few years after being in a car accident where he watched his twin brother die. When he tells people about the TBI and the accident and the service, he invariably gets the I could never imagine line. It makes me angry, he told me. Sure, he wants to say, you don't think you could understand, but what if I want you to? It's a difficult spot to be in for both. The civilian wants to respect what the veteran's gone through. The veteran wants to protect memories that are painful and sacred to him or her from outside judgment. But the result is the same. The veteran in a corner, by himself, able to proclaim about war but not discuss it, and the civilian shut out from a conversation about one of the most morally fraught activities our nation engages in war. And then we skip over to the other side. Um, the uh, last paragraph, second sentence. Believing war is beyond words is an abrogation responsibility. It lets civilians off the hook from trying to understand and veterans off the hook from needing to explain. You don't honor someone by telling them I can never imagine what you've been through. Instead, listen to their story and try to imagine being in it, no matter how hard or uncomfortable that feels. If the past 10 years have taught us anything, it's that in the age of an all-volunteer military, it's far too easy for Americans to send soldiers on deployment after deployment without making a serious effort to imagine what that means. We can do better. So provocative piece. Um, as you can see, he's offering a veteran's perspective on a particular topic, but also talking about a broader difficulty about sharing and understanding uh, that perspective. And our goal here and all these all the different days of um, sessions that you've had is to incorporate these perspectives in your classrooms. So where does that leave us? Does anybody here think this piece would fit into any of their classes? If so, what do you think you could add or contribute to what you're already doing? I mean, your discipline, I'm going to show up against maybe different, um, I can imagine, I can see a lot of disciplinary possibilities for this work. Um, and what do you make what place apply is saying here anyway? Is this idea that you don't honor someone by telling them I can't imagine what you've been through. Does that have relevance for other courses that you teach? Um, I'm really curious to hear a little bit about how you think we might be able to use this. Um, and so I want to give you a couple minutes to talk to the person next to you. If you are an instructor, and if you're not, well, I think most of us are teachers here. Um, so just take a second to imagine if you had to use this, um, how could you? And what might it add? I really do want actual voices to talk to the person next to you. I'll give you three minutes. So can you use the conversation? Should I just push standby or? Uh, you know, save us a couple of minutes.
being alert and alive at this stage in the afternoon. I'll try to give you a chance to talk again um, uh, toward the end, because I think it's, this is, you know, you're getting to see lots of different teaching strategies here as well, and I do this with all in our classes. It's just so nice to get up those voices, even if you're talking about lunch. Um, so how, how we can use this in our classes, and I'm hoping to get a little bit of a spectrum on a song here back there, yeah. In uh, in the therapy, uh, it, it's virtual ER, reality therapy. yeah, virtual reality therapy, and, and using this as a way to help students better understand what that is and, and why it's needed. Yeah, and, and the work that it can do. Um, anybody else in psychology with the thought of a different way to use it? There were a bunch of psychology kids before. No other disciplines? Yeah. In sociology, we talk about dramaturgy and the use of scripts in our everyday life, things that we're, we learn we're supposed to say. Yeah. And I think that we've learned as civilians that we're supposed to say, I could never imagine. Because you don't want to say, oh, I completely identify, right. because you can't, right? So I would teach this as part of a script and how sometimes our scripts can be askew from somebody's reality or an expectation. Yeah. And part of that skips off with a thank you for your service piece, which is also a really complicated moment in that conversation. Yeah. So um, there's a really cool BBC video that dramatizes, it's actually kind of a virtual reality moment, um, what goes through this veteran's mind when somebody says thank you for your service, and why it's such a difficult moment, even if even if you don't have a problem with what the people being thanked, how complicated what happens in your own mind when you're thinking of thanking them. Um, they have applicability to interrogation tactics. I have some 
something I'm pretty sure one of the first persons to kind of check at something I said about playing the leading games. He said that's what you do when you interrogate the suspect. You play the leading game to get them to talk. Um, so these strategies can cross the military civilian divide. And weirdly, with writing in particular, um, it, there's a lot of ways that we talk about writing that I think veterans, student veterans, have a better um, connection to and understanding of than a civilian student might. Um, which is nice, because sometimes they come into transition classes and they don't feel like they feel like they're behind in writing. Um, and we sometimes see that these reasons that we listen before you talk, um, try to get the intelligence before you act. Um, if you just put in a military metaphor, they're like, oh, actually, yeah, I didn't know already. It can be really cool to use this, this strategy of writing up. All right, writing. Any other? Any? We haven't really got any art yet. I don't know if there are art people. Uh, teach humanities and religion and help them to improve their thinking, allowing, moving away from the content of it uh, to the context, allowing different perspectives to come out and really understand the plurality of, of kind of understanding each other. And, yeah. Uh, really just getting a chance. Uh, and then also, my colleague here in the room also brought forth uh, we speak of religion in the beginning of the class before religion, helping to understand him and helping to really understand when you're dealing with very different topics and understanding uh, perspectives that are different from your own, how to engage that is the best way to engage that. Absolutely. And, and especially in modern mobile internet age, um, it's really important to into a bit of a paralysis with listening to others and making this move that flies complaining about, where it's like I could never um, dare to even try to understand where you're coming from out of, like somebody was saying, um, that that's part of the script and it's a movement of respect and you don't want to presume. And yet, fly well, saying, if you, what if I want you to try? Um, and that's really provocative. You think about all the conversations that, that our students are having right now and we're having about what's going on in the world, whether it's election or wars or um, police um, situations, it's um, to see students feel like they can't say anything for fear of hurt and, and um, tension, and it leaves them all in a very respectful corner, <laughs> unsure. It's, it's scary. It's scary uh, to try to figure out how to do what he's talking about. But I think you can have a really productive conversation with your students, um, even about even if you're a dorm an RA person. Um, here's where we're going. 
Um, we're going to start with World War I and the war was controversy, how it's relative beyond World War I, and then what it can teach us about reading war literature and engaging with veterans' perspectives. The goal of the talk is to suggest some ways in which I think we can all become better readers of war literature, but if all of us, according to the plan, we're going to do something more, uh, something better than that. Uh, my goal is that those of us who are civilians can become and help our students become better listeners to what veterans have to tell us. And I assume uh, some people in the audience are veterans. Um, and so presumably I already have a good idea of at least what one veteran might say to a civilian audience. Um, but for you, I hope that at least the texts and ideas I'm going to talk about are of some interest and maybe have helped you in talking about military experience and engaging student veterans in the classroom as you find me. Alright, so I do have pictures. I'm already thinking about ways I can make so much better. Um, I want to begin with a quick history lesson about World War I uh, and the books that come out of it. And as we begin, um, it's worth asking why am I choosing to focus this talk on World War I and the wars that came after instead of going back to the Civil War or the Crimean or the countless wars that came before. Uh, in some ways, the issue I'm talking about is timeless. Uh, surely, veterans have felt misunderstood by civilians at least as far back as forward, if not further. Um, but this phenomenon that I'm talking about takes on a new form of World War I. So. First of all, it wasn't until the 19th century that literacy was widespread enough for regular service members on the battlefields to consistently be able to tell their own stories about their experiences, and not until World War I that we have a truly international war being fought by these literate troops. The combination of literate soldiers, a multinational war, not to mention 20th century mass communications and print culture, creates a setting for a conversation about war art that simply couldn't have taken place at the same scale before 1900. In some senses, World War I is the first war in which it was possible to have a full-blown international controversy about how to tell a true war story. And that was just what the war was controversy was. So, with that explanation of why this story starts with World War I, let's look at the controversy. Uh, it all starts back in the 1920s with a flood of so-called war books that began around 1926. Um, from 1919 to 1926, there weren't very many. And then all of a sudden, around 1949, was this onslaught. Uh, more than I could fit on a slide. But some of them uh, are only known probably to people who study war, but um, T.E. Lawrence's The Seven Pillars of Wisdom, uh, Ford Maddox Ford starts publishing the segments of his Tetralogy, Brains End, um, Edmund London's. Was undertone of war um, in the pop there is a pretty famous one. Um, and uh, and after that, once we got past London, it just explodes in 1929. We get Germany's end, we get remarks all quiet on the Western Front. Um, RC Sheriff's play Journey's End, Richard Aldington's Death of a Hero, Robert Grace's Goodbye to all that. Kind of the, the books that if you know anything about World War One, you've heard of. Um, Ernst Dinger's The Storm of Steel. It's, the German one, um, and Charles Carrington's Subaltern's subaltern War, and at the very end, um, two years later, Sassoon's Memoirs of an Infantry Officer, and Frederick Manning's For Privates. We, um, we, we issue of Owen's poems and Fair Britain's Testament Youth. On the whole, these works get a good public and critical reception, especially All Quiet, which is probably the most of you know, is um, maybe one of the most famous war books of um, one if not of all time. The play called Journey's End is probably the most popular time. So people are liking these books. Here they are, so many of them. Um, but some critics, military historians, and senior military officers complained about these books in 1929. So much so that journalists began to talk about a so-called war books controversy. So that's where the conflict gets its name. The critics' main complaint is that these books focus too much on the war's horrors. As one Brigadier General put it, the war quote seem, I mean, the war books quote seem to be going out of their ways to show all the bad and horrible things about war. Others, and you know, my dissertation advisor, yeah, I remember the comment he wrote on my dissertation when I made this point about this next quote. Um, uh, I'm quoting Sir Ian Hamilton, who was the commander of the Gallipoli campaign. 
um, about a very successful campaign, focused his, uh, his criticism not on the books so much as on um, the marketing of the books. Um, Hamilton, in a 1930 speech that he's reported by the Times to the Piven, said that um, the blazing and largely deserved success of All Quiet on the Western Front and Journey's End had shown publishers how, by employing finer writers and by cutting out thoroughly any touches of self-sacrifice, devotion, or love of adventure, they get on better with the task of the public. Yes, but surely he was a Philistine. <laughs> <laughs> Only a Philistine. That, pretty much ever since then, I've been ranting against that comment. Um, so, um, two scholars um, start to kind of articulate this um, complaint that these people are making, and the two most famous voices that come out are Douglas Gerald and Cyril Falls. They're both um, official military historians. They both also served in World War I. Their respective books, The Lie About the War and uh, War Books, A Critical Guide, they both echo what Hamilton said before. Like him, they thought the war books were distorting the story of the war for the sake of creating pacifist propaganda, and they thought that was a dangerous thing. All right, so we've got people who like the war books, people who are complaining about them, but then a third group emerges in this debate, and this group includes some of the authors of the war books themselves. Um, and these authors bring in a different opinion. Their idea is that the negative picture, um, or the myth, uh, anti-war myth about these war, about the war, um, that the war books are being credited with, they're saying, hold on, hold on, this isn't actually in our books, this picture of the war you're talking about, this anti-war narrative. Um, Robert Graves, for instance, denied that his 1929 classic, Goodbye to All That, contained an anti-war message. And he at least said, Robert Graves, we can't ever fully trust him, but he said he was surprised at being acclaimed in headlines of daily papers as the author of a violent treatise against the war. For I'm trying not to show any bias for or against war, but merely to describe what happened to me during a particular and not at all typical one in which I took part. So, again, for those of you who have raised, he's tricky, it's never clear how straight you're supposed to take him. Even if he's being a little facetious here, uh, it's true that this, his book is by no means as anti-war as some of the people. For some reason, it's game. It's not the same by any, in any way as uh, to give you another example of a veteran author protesting against being labeled as an anti-war writer, um, Charles Carrington, you know, quite, quite frankly, <laughs> politics become rather colorful later on, um, he also didn't see his book as fitting with the popular picture of the war. In the epilogue to his 1929 book, uh, The Subaltern's War, he writes that the legend has grown up, propagated not by soldiers but by journalists. Ah, the press. That these men who went gaily to fight in the mood of Rupert Brooke and Julian Grenfell lost their faith amid the horrors of the trenches and returned in a mood of anger and despair. But the legend of disenchantment is false. This third position in the war books controversy has it that some war books, like All Quiet, were pushing a particularly negative picture of the war and a pacifist agenda. Um, Lamar is explicitly a pacifist at some stage of his life. And the reading public was mistakenly generalizing from those books to all the books published in the same five-year time span, picking and choosing the parts uh, of the other war books that confirmed the all-quiet version of the war and ignoring parts that did. And there's particular examples of this. You can see the way that some um, journals of uh, soldiers were edited during this period, and they edited out all the inconvenient bits that talked about people feeling proud of their service or feeling um, like what they did was they did in the world's worthwhile, they like ended that part out because it doesn't fit the narrative. Um, it's spectacular to look at those editions. Um, so just to give you a clearer sense of what I'm referring to when I talk about this all quiet version um, or myth of the war, I want to quote one of my favorite scholars of World War I literature, uh, Samuel Hines. Most people will think about Paul Fussell, pretty much the most famous literary scholar in World War I. Um, and like Hines, he's also a World War II veteran. Um, so he uh, talks about what he calls a mythic version of the war that emerges in the American and British public imagination in the decades after the war. 
and he sums up his basic element. Pay attention to the ones. Here's the myth. A generation of innocent young men, their heads full of high abstractions like honor, glory, and England, went off to make the world safe for democracy. They were slaughtered in stupid battles planned by stupid generals. Those who survived were shocked, disillusioned, and embittered by their war experiences and saw that their real enemies were not the Germans, but the old men at home who had lied to them. They rejected the values of the society that had sent them to war and in so doing separated their own generation from the past from their cultural inheritance. So I don't know how many of you have read All Quiet on the Western Front, but if, for those of you who have, it's hard to find an element of that myth that we just rehearsed that's not contained in that novel. It's pretty much, there's other parts of the novel, but everything in that list is in All Quiet. In some ways, All Quiet is thus the exemplar of this myth. But then, as Grace and Carrington are suggesting, there are other works published in the same era, lumped in the same category of war books that don't fit the myth nearly as well. Ernst Jünger's Storm of Steel is probably the most extreme example, I'll talk about that one in a moment, um, but Graves' book from Carrington's and many others fall in this category as well. Okay, so, given all of this, here's what I find interesting and worth teaching students about at this point, uh, what I'm talking about. All these war books get published in the 20s and 30s, they help to create this anti-war narrative, but then some readers, and even some authors, um, don't see them as fitting this mythic version or as pushing this anti-war agenda. So there's a disconnect here. We've got a bunch of books coming out about a war and a growing controversy about them. But the controversy isn't always connected to what's in the books themselves. On the one hand, we have readers and critics seeing a particular version of the war being created by these books, the victimized soldiers, the stupid battles, the disillusionment, the old men. And in some cases, uh, these readers and critics are going to attack that as dangerous pacifist propaganda. But then on the other hand, you have Graves saying, my book isn't anti-war. And Carrington saying, the myth of disillusionment is false. So when I teach the war books controversy, my first goal is just to get my students to see this problem. And it's pretty simple to do that. I start by having to read all quiet, because it sums up everything they think they know about World War I uh, so perfectly. Um, that, so they really enjoy reading it, because they're like, yes, check, check. This is what I know about the war. And I really enjoy it. It's a great book. A lot of it's really pleasurable to teach us. Um, and it serves a lot of, there's a lot of reasons to serve a war course for that. Um, after they've read All Quiet though, I then give them a series of excerpts from other war books to basically blow their minds. <laughs> I start with Ernst Jünger's Storm of Steel because um, it's about as far from All Quiet as it can get. Toward the end of All Quiet, for instance, uh, remarks narrator Paul Baumer offers this assessment of the state in which surviving soldiers found themselves at the end of the war. So this is all honor about here. Um, this is the mark. Uh, if they even make it home, he says, we will be weary, broken, burnt out, rootless, and without hope. We will not be able to find our way anymore. This is the narrative of disillusion. Younger, on the other hand, even by the end of the war, is not only optimistic, but enthusiastic about the unifying influence of war and military experience. It's a very romantic. He sees this is going to unify the guys who cares about your body, and he's all the way through the end championing that power. So, um, look at how different he says his own says. He says, Time only strengthens my conviction that the war, for all its destructiveness, was an incomparable schooling of the heart. Students see that remarks uh, narrator's disillusionment and anti-war stances, for better or worse, if you know you know, you know he goes on to some interesting politics as well. Um, this anti-war stance is by no means universal among all German soldiers in the First World War. There is no disillusionment in Jünger's book, no laments about the betrayal of the young by the old, and certainly no passive. Now that the students have been shaken up a little, um, I'd then like to uh, turn to Richard Aldington's wonderful short story, At All Costs, to show how different um, from All Quiet a war story becomes when it's told in this minimal stripped down style um, and that's characteristic. I call it old soldier prose. It's, it's a certain genre of war writing, very different from the Marx. There's rarely a moment in All Quiet when we don't know exactly what the Marx narrator is thinking uh, about and feeling about his experiences or about how they connect to these broader theories about the war. In Aldington's cryptic short story, however, it's very different. Uh, yeah, 
the story, uh, all these stories pretty bleak. Um, it's a very under undermanned trench. Um, and uh, an officer comes forward and says, okay guys, here's what you're gonna do. Um, you're in part of the line, there's a big attack over there, we need you to draw some fire over here, but there's not really enough here to defend this trench, so we would like you to um, put some people forward, create some lines, um, and fire a flare when that being next to you so we can adjust the artillery. So your goal is to stand there, fire a flare, hopefully before you're killed, and that's what you need to do. So the story is the 24 hours between when they get that order and when they carry it out. And you can imagine what Remark's version of the story would be, because he likes to tell you how things feel and what they mean, and all these version is nothing like it. Um, even though all these gives us access to his narrator's thoughts and feelings, neither are very eloquent, and neither connect up to any sort of larger theory or argument about the significance of the war. In the last 24 hours of their lives, we watch as the men set up their gun positions, decide who will be stationed where for the attack, and play cards. There's some moments of emotional wrangling, but it's pretty limited and pretty, pretty tamped down. In the end, the story tapers down to simple dialogue and some very minimal narration. Again, contrast with Remark is striking. Uh, here, for instance, is Remark talking about how hard it is to keep fighting and turn back toward the front lines after staving off an attack. Oh, this turning back again. We reach the shelter of the reserve lines and yearn to creep in and disappear, but again we must turn around again and plunge into the horror. Now we look at the same situation rendered in all of these minimal dialogue. Bombing attack, beaten off, sir. Very good, carry on. There's only two of us left, sir. Carry on. Very good, sir. Student <laughs> boy. This is a totally other way to tell the story. Same story, different story. <coughs> yeah, and the students start to feel very unsettled, and they're really starting to see now the way these narrative styles are pushing against the style and picture of the war, given it all. But to finish this job of freaking out the students, I end the section of the course by teaching an essay by the World War I veteran and economic historian, R. H. Tawney. Probably oh, nobody's ever heard of him. He's amazing. Tony writes about the complexity of soldiers' responses to the war, and he argues that it's soldiers, uh, that it's the civilians, not the soldiers, who have become disillusioned and broken faith with the past. I love teaching this text because what he has to say is so interesting, so different from what we used to do in World War One, and word for word, uh, a lot of echoes with what Fly was saying in the beginning. This is uh, it's kind of a long quote, and <clears throat> brace yourself, great new PowerPoint rules, brain and left. Listen to what he has to say about that crucial element of the all quiet picture of the war, disillusionment. Less exposed than a civilian to new intellectual influences, the soldier is apt to retain firmly or even to deepen the impressions which made him often reluctantly a soldier in the first instance. He is like a piece of stone which, in spite of constant friction, preserves the form originally stuck out in the fires of a volcanic upheaval. How often, fatigued beyond endurance or horrified by one's actions, does one not recur to these ideas for support and consolation? It is worth it because it is awful, but I need not loathe myself because. We see things which you can only imagine. We are strengthened by reflections which you have abandoned. Our minds differ from yours both because they are more exposed to change and because they are less changeable. While you seem, forgive me if I am rude, to have been surrendering your creeds with the nervous facility of a tutor uh, official, our foreground may be different, but our background is the same. It's that of August to September 1914, beginning of the war. We are your ghosts. Talk a little bit more about that later, but it's pretty different from all quiet, and that difference leaves the students in what I hope is a productive theater. They like all quiet, they think, ah, that's the story of the war. But then they see there are all these other stories being told, some even by some of the war's most famous authors that totally contradict um, both the form and the content of the <coughs> story. 
So at this point in the class, I turn to what is to be the most fascinating moment of the war books controversy. It's the 1933 debate in the pages of the New Republic between um, two American World War I veterans who also happen to be famous poets, famous literary figures, Archibald McLeish and Malcolm Cowley.
It matched great cruelty with great courage. It had its fine sights and its unspeakable sights. It was a human war. Its adversaries were men, and its stories were stories of men. Mr. Stallings is familiar with that war, more familiar than most Americans. Stallings is overseas. And he has alluded elsewhere in his other books. So where McLeish criticizes Stallings for simplifying this more complicated mixed picture of the war, Cowley does the exact opposite. He celebrates Stallings for doing this and criticizes McLeish for wanting anything other than an extreme pacifist critique uh, of war from a war book. Cowley has really good reason for saying what he's got to say. Crowley um, says, if we emphasize the useless deaths of the last war, if we do this kind of really extreme anti-war art, we can be certain of our attitude toward the next. But if, on the other hand, we emphasize the happy illusions of these men who die defending their country, then we can look forward to the battles in which other generous and loyal men will die in the same courageous fashion. Both of these positions are strong, and my main goal in teaching them is to make students see that strength. This isn't an easily resolved argument, but it's a crucial one for students of war literature, and indeed, I think for anybody who's interested in war or art. I have two motives in particular for teaching this hard to resolve controversy in my class on the literature of war. The first one's pretty easy, so I'll give you that, and then the rest of the talk will be the more complicated one. Um, the easy reason is it has to do with making my students better in terms of art. I don't want them, like the dogmatic readers of the war books, to miss the difference between a book like All Quiet and one like Who Buy All That or All We Can Strip a Short Story. And I certainly don't want them to, pro to project an anti-war slogan on a war text um, if that text happens to be offering a more complicated and engaged like picture of our military experiences. I'll get to my second and bigger reason uh, at the end today. But before I do that, um, I'll turn to the second part of my talk and show you um, how the war was controversy as well in more recent war literature. Um, we'll get that game, I think, by using it in the frame of coming in more recent literature. Um, so at this point, we're going to shift focus and come at the issue from what seems at first to be a really different starting point. Uh, the new starting point is a pattern I've been noticing um, in literary critics' responses and just book critics' responses to recent war books, and specifically in the reviews of Kevin Powers' 2012 war novel, The Yellow Birds. <coughs> Um, Powers served in the U.S. Army in Iraq from 2004 to 2005, and the Yellow Birds tells the story of a soldier, Private John Parkle, uh, in the Iraq War in 2004 and after he returns home. The reviews for the book are mostly positive, but in almost every one you see the similar thing happen. The critic will praise the book and its characters and writing, but then shift gears and express some reservations about its really long poetic passages and wordy descriptions. To give you an example, here's an excerpt from a 2012 New York Times book review of the book. Um, the reviewer is Benjamin Percy, and he starts by drawing attention to Powers' strength as a writer. Says, Powers has a master's degree in poetry from UT Austin, and his book accounts are evident in the quote, music of his sentences. After praising the poetic quality of the book, though, Percy then questions its value. Here's what he goes on to say about the poetic qualities of the book he has just been reading. Of course, fancy phrasing can be a distraction as well, and Powers occasionally stumbles, especially when Barbara is thoughtfully processing the war or staring moodily out at the landscape. And he gives an example in the book, this long description of clouds over the ocean. Percy's criticism is fair enough. Some of the passages, this one about the clouds over the ocean, definitely included, are long and hard to follow, and not necessarily the best part of the book for readers. But to some degree, what's going on in this moment with the book review? It goes beyond this particular novel and beyond this particular war. To see how that's the case, we've got to go back one more time to Arthur McLeish. Actually, there's going to be several times we go back to Arthur McLeish and his description of what war books are up to or should be. That long quote again. Um, Best art knows no fashions or preconceived patterns, has neither morality nor text nor lessons, records those things which have actually occurred, legibility being the only test of selection. And it records them regardless of their effect upon the minds of the young or the minds of the old, regardless of their capacity for arousing anger or enthusiasm or pacifism. It records them because they are an expression of the world and because the sole motivation of the artist is an obscure and personal compulsion to arrest, to fix, to make expressive the flowing away of the world. This description of what all art, including war stories, ought, uh, can or ought to be, 
It's the bridge that connects the Warbles controversy of the 30s to our New York Times uh, book review of Powers as well. So, time's up that we have left, I'll just show you how that connection works. Um, in this passage on the screen, what McLeish is defending is the right of artists to offer certain kinds of descriptions. And more particularly, he's defending the right of veteran artists to talk about their experience in all its complexity and individuality and detail, and without any recourse to the pictures of the war that have been crafted by the war books. And so here's where we finally make the connection um, between the two centuries. At the risk of being radically ahistorical, I know there's a lot of historians nervously, and none of them commented on using that first piece. Um, so, throw tomatoes if you need to. Um, I'm going to suggest some, that the same conflict between readers' expectations about war and what soldiers actually have to say about their experiences. Um, this conflict between, as McLeish puts it, the war was picture of the war and the one by the soldiers who use this method of the artist. I'm going to suggest that that conflict runs more or less continuously unchanged from 1930 to today. Of course, different wars have different grand narratives attached to them. World War II was the good war, Vietnam with its bright, shiny lie narrative. But from World War I to today, you can see almost continuous line of veteran authors pushing back against the readers' expectations and against the idea that there's only one story to tell about a particular war. That there is, as Cowley, the champions of the war books insisted, no possible room for any other narrative besides whatever um, is going to be most um, politically effective in the games of that war. For a wonderful example of this veteran pushback um, against people who say there's only one story. We don't have to look any further than a 2013 interview that Terry Gross um, on Fresh Air did with Royce Branch and Jacob Siegel. They are the editors of this 2013 collection. Um, short stories, Fire and Forget. I didn't realize until today that Fire and Forget is actually kind of a missile. I didn't know that. Um, it's also a good title for a short story collection. Um, you fire this missile and you don't have to deal with it. It steers itself. While McLeish and the veterans who pushed back against the war books in the 1930s complained about being put in a box by the public's expectations about the war, Jacob Siegel put the same problem in broader terms. He doesn't frame it anymore in terms of particular expectations about a particular war, but in terms of a more general expectation about what a war book is and what a war book has to offer to readers. So he's talking about the conflict that soldiers sometimes face when they're telling their stories, and this is what he says. I think there's this continuous media appetite for war as narratives of daring do and of heroism, which is part of it. And then there's an appetite for war where soldiers are just pawns in various political polemics. It's all for people who often, to the soldier, seem like they have no genuine interest in what it's really like. They just want to be entertained or have their opinions validated. It seems like they have no genuine interest in what it's really like. That's harsh criticism and perhaps unfair, and we think back to the flying opening, uh, but echoed again and again by frustrated veterans from well before the First World War to today. It's as if the reading public somehow doesn't trust the people who've been to war to tell us what it's like. You know, there's an argument to be made there. They, their first person experience isn't the only one, um, but surely it is a perspective. Uh, we ask them to tell us and then when they do, if it doesn't match our expectations, we don't listen. Um, as if, as Siegel says, people have no genuine interest in what it's really like. They just want to be entertained or have their opinions validated. So I want to take Siegel's complaint seriously and ask what would happen if we, that is, we were part of the civilian audience, put aside our appetites and expectations about war literature and really tried to listen to what veteran authors might be trying to tell us about what war is, quote, really like. <laughs> what might they tell us or show us about war or their experience of it that we might otherwise be missing? At first place, what they have to tell us isn't all that satisfying. An example of this unsatisfying quality is provided by a famous passage in Tim O'Brien's 1973 memoir, If I Died in Combat Zone. O'Brien, he's writing 40 years after McLeish's impassioned defense of a World War I veteran's right to express his own experience of the war instead of this prefabricated anti-war narrative. And of course, O'Brien's writing for the Vietnam War rather than World War I. But his point and Gleesh's, they're the same. In laying out the two options for how to write about the war in a way that fits the public's expectations versus a way that doesn't, O'Brien makes clear why books that express individual soldiers' impressions of war might not be easy to sell in the way that books that conform to expectations are. Here's O'Brien talking about what the war stories that he could write and the ones that he chooses to. 
He says, it would be fine to persuade my younger brother and perhaps some others to say no to wrong wars, or it would be fine to confirm the old beliefs about war. It's horrible, but it's a crucible of men and events in the end and makes more of a man of you. It would be fine, O'Brien tells us, to write an anti-war propaganda piece, as Cowley says he ought to, or to confirm old beliefs about war. But he hesitates. Still, none of this seems right. And now look what happens. There's a really big shift in his writing style as he moves from the grand cliches about war to a different kind of storytelling. But still, none of this seems right. Men die. Dead human beings are heavy and awkward to carry. Things smell different in Vietnam. Soldiers are dreamers. Drill sergeants are bored. Some men thought the war was proper and others didn't. Most didn't care. Is that the stuff for a morality lesson, even for a theme? Do dreams offer lessons? Do nightmares have themes? Do we awaken and analyze them and live our lives and advise others as a result? Can the foot soldier teach anything about the importance of war merely for having been there? I think not. He can tell war stories. Soldiers, O'Brien tells us, can't teach moral lessons about war. They can't teach us much at all. What they can do is tell war stories. So I'm reading his words here. Notice how he's echoing McLeish's words from 1933. <coughs> There's O'Brien. Morality, lessons, uh, in both cases, art can't teach either. The method of the artist, McLeish said, has neither morality nor text nor lesson. It records these things, seen or unseen, which have actually occurred. Not those grand narratives at the top of the O'Brien stanza, the blunt facts and impressions and experiences. Men die. Dead human beings are awkward and heavy to carry. Things smell different in Vietnam. Now, first glance, these are hardly earth-shattering revelations, and you can understand why readers might look for something more. If not narratives of daring do, as Siegel would have it, at least narratives of some sort, not strange cryptic descriptions like the one O'Brien is giving us here. Veterans who push back against media appetites for familiar war narratives are not telling us a story about war. They're telling us a story of how war changes the way they see the world around them. Not the way they see war particularly, but the way they see things as seemingly unrelated as those clouds over the ocean in Powers' is novel that the critic is complaining about. So in the New York Times book reviewer, Benjamin Percy complains about that fancy phrasing used to describe a character, quote, staring moodily out at the landscape. I want to suggest that he's at least potentially missing something important about what war books have to tell us. But the crucial part of what war books have to tell us is not a message about war or what it means, but about how war changes the way in which people see. To get a, a sense of the way they smell. To get a sense of what this means, it's helpful to start with a picture. And um, we have enough time to take a break and talk again a little bit. Um, so I will ask you to talk in a minute. Waking up. So this is a painting called Swan Upping and Cookham. It was painted by a British artist named Sir Stanley Spencer. Uh, the subject is an annual ritual on the River Thames in which, um, in England, which swans are marked as belonging to the Queen's. You see some swans back there. Um, but I want to draw your attention to the form of the painting. Do you notice anything strange about the way things are represented here? I'm going to make it a little bit bigger. Um, I guess I'll have to ask somebody to be brave. If anybody wants to talk about art, is there anything that jumps out to you as odd or distinctive? Um, I particularly would steer you towards um, what might be going on with the way the water looks. Yeah. Looks a bit distorted. A bit distorted, yeah. So we're drawing attention to either he's not a very good at doing realistic perspective, or he's deliberately trying to make things look a little distorted. The people seem not quite to be um, able to stand up, like they fall out of the picture. Um, so a little distorted. Anything else that anybody notices about the way the form of this, and particularly about the way the water looks? And how easy it is to see from where you are. Does it look like any difference in the way the water is Do you have a question? No. Oh, it looks like it's curving down. Like it's curving down, yeah. Um, you can see that um, it's kind of a line with the water. What's up with the way the water is? It's a little different in one place than the other, right? Um, there's, there's a line between 
what you might call a kind of realistically depicted um, water towards the back, suggesting the sky can paint traditional representation of water. But then how's the water look in the front? It looks not really like water at all, more like, I don't know, ripples of cement. All right, so I want to give you guys a chance to breathe and think for a second, and um, here's what I'm going to do to, having drawn your attention to this line in the middle of the painting where the water changes, I'm going to tell you that this painting was painted twice. It was painted over a course of time. You know World War I, those dates are kind of significant. He started the painting in 1915 before he deployed the Western Front. He thought about painting the whole time he was serving. I got to get back and finish my painting. Also, what the heck's wrong with me? How can I be up going back to a painting and everything that I'm doing is so much more important? Um, he struggled to finish the painting when he got back to the He comes back to the service in 1919 um, and finishes it. So, my question for you is does that change your reading of this painting and, and change? particularly in the way the water is painted. Can you tell me a story, make any hypotheses about um, what, what's going on in this painting now that you know it's painted before and after military service um, that you might not be able to make otherwise? Um, so take, take a couple minutes just to talk to the person next to you just to gather up your thoughts on this because um, it's a little bit of a hard <laughs> Well, I'm curious, like, um, what your hypothesis would be as to which part came first and which part came after. Person's personal experience and a big art movement 
could be connected to each other. Um, I see a lot of connections between diaries from the First World War and some of the modern prose style. So I think some of the artists are learning from some of the frontline soldiers. Well, it is nice to see that uh, you know, so many people look at art from, this, from that period or after that period. You know, Picasso and all the rest of them are just that they can't think. But if you look at this, this is a great example of how someone knows how to yeah. paint and knows I know how to paint, but I'm going to distort and I'm going to make it look distort. deliberate. Deliberate. Yeah, absolutely. All right, there's a lot more to say. This is a really cool uh, uh, image to use for teaching, but I want to get us out of here. Um, there's a lot to say about painting and what it suggests about war and art and representation, but for now, I'll settle for just saying that I think it's the visual equivalent of the shift in Orion's passage from grand narratives to rough details um, and tra traumatically roughing details. Um, and it's telling us something about what war is and how it changes the people who take part in it. To translate an explanation of sense of painting, and by the way, yes, he did paint a lot of times when he came back to talk about Translate an explanation of Spencer's painting and how war changes how people see it. These are terms of a more recent veteran. I'm going to try and play an excerpt from a um, guy who won the Medal of Honor to make a tribute about it. Um, i got two options, so hopefully one of them will work. Um, this is um, Army Staff Sergeant Ty Michael Carter. Um, he's talking in 2013. It's an NPR interview on the occasion of his being awarded the Medal of Honor. At this point in the interview, he's just finished talking about the circumstances in which he won the Medal of Honor. And uh, he's talking a little bit about trauma and the issue of how what he's been through has affected not just his life, but the way he sees the world. So let's see. Right before him. What happened to me? Uh, pretty much changed my view of a lot of things. For example, I was walking through an airport and I saw a picture that advertised travel and there was a mother and a father and a little girl there at like the Grand Canyon or some uh, national park. Instantly I felt a large amount of sorrow because I was transported back to the night after the firefight where I imagined my daughter growing up without a daddy. So all within a fraction of a second you're slammed with all these emotions and memories. It takes a lot of effort to choke back the tears and try to act normal. It, what happened to me pretty much changed my view of a lot of things, as we said. Oops. To say the least, Mr. Sir Stanley Spencer, Archibald McLeish, and Tim O'Brien would all firmly nod their heads at that. In different ways, they're each telling us the same thing that Carter is, that war changes how people see and that that change matters. So when soldiers tell us stories, they're not just telling us stories about war, they're telling us stories about how their ways of seeing the world have changed. And when a veteran like Kevin Powers breaks the action in his war novel to tell us about how clouds look, quote, like soiled linens on an unmade bed, or about, quote, strange connections made inside his mind during a firefight, or about what it looks like when mortars fall on an orchard, you should pay attention. Here's what he has to say about mortars falling. When the mortars fell, the leaves and fruit and birds were frayed like ends of rope. They lay on the ground in scattered piles, torn feathers and leaves and the rinds of broken fruit intermingling. The sunlight fell absently through the spaces in the treetops here and there glistening as if on water from smudges of bird blood and citrus. And a passage like this one has to tell us isn't clear or obvious, no more so than the change in the water in Spencer's painting is, but it's important. Maybe it's telling us something about the broken boundary between animal creatures and things, or about the apparent unconcern of nature for the sufferings of mortal beings, or about the strange beauty of death. Maybe like Carter, Powers is trying to capture a memory that slams him with emotion. Or maybe this is a quieter and sadder image. But either way, Powers is telling us what he sees and how he sees it. And we need to figure out how to pay attention to that. If we want to stop fighting the battle of the war books and start figuring out how to better respond to the messy, confusing representations that veteran artists like Spencer and O'Brien and Powers and so many others are giving us, we have to start figuring out how we can attend to these confusing descriptions instead of getting frustrated with them. 
we can do so, it will make us better readers and teachers of war literature, but I hope we can do something more important than that. To explain that something more, um, I want to come back to what I mentioned earlier about my two reasons for teaching the war books controversy in my literature classes. Um, the first reason is, as I said, about how my students become better readers and interpreters of art and literature. I think more of the war books are like that swan up in painting than people give them credit for, and too many people readers, even today, project an anti-war message or any single fully defined message at all onto something that's far more complicated and harder to pin down. And that's a problem I want my students to think about and be aware of. Um, to think more about it. Um, so we're at the end now. Almost done. My second and final reason for teaching the final the war books controversy is a little less academic, but I hope it'll be no less legitimate than the first. To explain it, we gotta go one more time back to Commission Cowley. Um, and their fight about how to tell the story of World War I. As it's probably clear to you at this point, I share with this frustration of what happens to veterans when popular myths and beliefs about a particular war overshadow and take precedence over the messier and more complicated stories that they, and indeed many people with first-hand experience of war, um, civilians and children that Dr. Lenz was talking with us about earlier, um, the stories that all those people have to tell us about what war is like. These messy, varied stories don't necessarily come together to form politically useful messages about a given war or war in general, but they deserve our attention nevertheless because they represent the attempts of human beings to express what war was like to them, what it was like in their heads, and those attempts matter. Malcolm Crowley's rebuttal of this position is simple. Remember, when it comes to trying to tell a story about World War I, we can't worry about what it was like in people's heads, even the heads of those men who fought and died in it. Those niceties of honoring another person's perspective could never compete with the far greater and more urgent priority of trying to prevent another war. So long as wars continue, military service members and many others too are going to continue to be killed, no matter what interesting thoughts they might have had about their experience. That was the same for the dead in World War I. There's the palaces about them. However they felt about it, they were killed. Patriotism? Love of danger, fear, boredom, disgust, all the things that went on inside their heads didn't matter. The shells burst, the machine guns tick tick tacked, and presently they became the things that Stallings shows us in his photographs. A hand sticking out of the mud, a carcass blown by flies, a unit in a pile of corpses, an entry in a ledger at headquarters. These dead, Crowley says, are not what he and McLeish are really arguing about. The real topic of their argument should be how to prevent more people from getting killed in another war. McLeish totally disagrees. He argues what's in the heads of those who fought, and especially those who died in the war, deserves to be honored, no matter how deluded or ironic it might come to seem in retrospect. I teach this a lot with experts from the Marines talking about pollution. Um, it's the same conversation. And, and what happened later doesn't have to do what happened then. In an angry moment, uh, McLeish says something that is interesting and very relevant for discussions of the military civilian you have today. That's what I want to end with. Um, and it's especially interesting that this modern phenomenon in which veterans are either raised up as idealized heroes or pitied as broken victims of political powers beyond their control. If this picture of the veteran is victim, certainly the 1933 um, version, um, but maybe also our 2016 version of the English is picking up on this as this. Um, I can see that it is today not only moral, but unfashionable as well to doubt that all the dead were victims, to suggest that some few ridiculously believed in the thing for which, or so they thought, they died. McLeish stands in opposition to that fashionable condescension. His biggest complaint about Stalin's book is that it subsumes more complex pictures of soldiers' ideas about the war for the sake of a political goal. The goal is worthy, but can't justify the means required to achieve it. This insistence on the value of what individual veterans have to tell us about their perceptions of war, no matter how complicated, contradictory, or politically incoherent uh, and inconvenient it may be, is something I think it's important to understand. Helping my students do so is the second and far more important goal I have in teaching the war was controversy. Um, I teach literature war, and I hope you might find it helpful as well. Thank you.